this video we're going to be looking back at all four Red Faction games, a fantastic, if inconsistent, series of B-action games set on Mars. It's going to be a shorter video than usual because there's less to talk about, but Red Faction is a fascinating franchise and well worth taking a look at. Let's get into it. There's a new Call of Duty and a new Assassin's Creed every year. For these high-budget AAA titles, their formats are proven and profitable, and considering their budgets, they don't really make many deviations from the design decisions that have brought them so much money. It's a different world for B-games, lower-budget franchises who have to be clever and creative to stand out, or else fade out entirely. Red Faction is unique even among B-franchises. It's had two extremely memorable, charismatic games, followed by mediocre sequels that make the series disappear for years. It's rare for franchises to get second chances, even rarer to make the same mistakes twice and still persist. Despite being canned after the fourth game, it looks like Red Faction will even survive the bankruptcy of its original developer. The first game, though, is a real classic, not because it's great, it's not great, but it is overwhelmingly ambitious, fast-paced, and full of personality. Other critics, especially around the time of its release, made many comparisons to the original Half-Life, casting Red Faction as a kind of lower-budget take on the stylistic changes Half-Life brought to the first-person shooter genre. The main way it follows in Half-Life's footsteps is in its pacing and its level design. It's a one-foot-after-another continuous linear journey through realistically proportioned environments with a natural feeling escalation of scale and conflict. The way a player interacts with both games, the mechanical feel of them, is pretty much the same. Red Faction is different in every other way besides this core design philosophy, however. From tone, to handling the player character, to overall quality, it's an ambitious game. Many of those ambitions are left unfulfilled by the time the credits roll. But even if Red Faction can't live up to its own aspirations, damned if the game doesn't have an unbelievably good time taking a crack at it. To prove it wasn't a Half-Life derivative, Red Faction set out early to have a unique feature, and it set its sights on destructible environments. Wouldn't it be amazing if rockets left actual craters, or if you could tunnel around locked doors with explosives and blow open secret areas? Of course it would be. For Red Faction, the, chal the challenge wasn't just turning that cool idea into programming reality, it was to do that in a way that would run on the PlayStation 2. So, with that limitation in place, you can start dialing back your expectations for how the mechanic was actually going to work out in practice rather than principle. The cool thing about Red Faction, though, is that instead of implementing a broken mechanic, they just limited the scope of the environments to give the player a more limited set of circumstances where this feature, Geomod, could be used. It's very much in the early game, in the mines, and there are a tremendous variety of routes through those early levels on account of clever use of Geomod, but after that it comes up less and less frequently. Typically, Geomod only comes up for set-piece moments where blowing things up is part of a specific puzzle and not as a general option for level exploration. In a certain way, that's a disappointment. But with the budget they had and the system that they were coding for, they did a genuinely excellent job. And Geomod's far from the only thing Red Faction has going for it. Geomod the gimmick goes hand-in-hand -hand with the game's story of a miner's rebellion on Mars, giving Parker, the player character, a chance to really put his demolition skills to the test. The setup for the game is at the heart of why people love Red Faction. The revolutionary backdrop is the perfect way to cause mayhem, be the good guy, and keep the plot moving. Setting it on Mars, a gritty working class Mars, gives Red Faction an extra edge. Although the development team said they didn't set out to deliberately model the game after the 1990 film Total Recall, the movie very much influenced the tone and presentation of Red Faction's Mars. It works great that way, a kind of casual appropriation of the film's mood with no real specific references. While Red Faction doesn't do a slow build-up like Half-Life does, the plot doesn't really need it. The working conditions for the miners are beyond deplorable, and the guards are all ready for the revolt they know is coming. The fact that the powder keg blows in the first 30 seconds of gameplay is kind of beside the point. The player is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and now it's advance or die. Plus, the gunplay is more fast-paced and frenetic than Half-Life, with a deeply satisfying arsenal of first-person shooter standards and a couple of franchise firsts. The most iconic gun from the first game is surely the railgun, with a thermal scope that could see through walls and an accelerated projectile that could pierce them. It's outrageous fun, even if it's hard to counter when you're up against it yourself. Enemies in Red Faction do provide a solid challenge for most sections of the game, but it never takes too long to cut through a swath of them, and Red Faction mixes up the combat with a lot of variety on a pretty consistent basis. Vehicles are one of the chief ways it breaks it up. There's an extensive submarine sequence, an air fighter sequence, and some throwaway bits where you can drive a jeep. The variety and momentum, along with the revolutionary motivation providing a pretty clear framework for whatever you're doing, all come together to make pacing one of Red Faction's real strengths. It pulls you right along. And while Half-Life is a better looking game, with level architecture and environments that make more sense and look sharper, Red Faction does do a great job of guiding the player through a Mars that feels plausible, despite the cheese of the script. 
A good example is about a quarter of the way into the game, where you finally get to the shuttle bay and try to escape Mars. You battle your way through the mines, the barracks, minor registration, here you are, triumphant, right? But you're late, and the shuttle's already leaving, and then it gets promptly destroyed by Ultor's anti-air system. So what now, genius? Red Faction has a good grip on what makes a fun setup, and how to flesh out that setup with combat and exploration. What it does not have a good grip on is, is when to stop and refine what they have. Maybe being slow is such a bad... Red Faction is ambitious to the point where a lot of what's in the game, maybe a full quarter of it, is badly produced and completely unnecessary. It's two, or one, depending on what vent you drop down, mandatory stealth sequences are famously terrible. Stealth is hard to implement. There were many games, like Thief, that used stealth to great effect by the time Red Faction arrived on the scene, but Thief was all about the stealth, was careful with it. Red Faction just throws it in and hopes it works. It doesn't. And even if the vehicle segments add variety, they are relentlessly boring from a design perspective. To make the levels huge, they cut detail out. A lot of detail. Whether it's the submarine, the aircraft, or the APC, you're spending about 15 minutes apiece going down a long, twisting hallway with no decoration. Sometimes it's a cave hallway, sometimes it's a canyon hallway, but we're still talking hallways. Red Faction can suffer from blandness in a number of its levels and environments, but the pacing pulls you through the boring areas and out the other end quickly enough that they don't become the player's whole experience. There is enough that's genuinely memorable in the game, that what's forgettable is forgotten, and the rest is how Red Faction sits in your memory, short and likable. What's easy to forget, and something I certainly forgot about the game, is that although the gameplay is fun and the setup is quietly brilliant, the script is a complete disaster. It's got some of the most genuinely idiotic dialogue you can find in gaming at large, and the worst is from Parker, the player character. When you think about Half-Life, the fact that Freeman never speaks is one of the key design elements. He's the player, after all. Not speaking allows the player to react to the plot without being contradicted by the character they're playing. Comparatively, I hate everything about Parker. He's got the depth of a pancake mixed with the social graces of Gary Busey. Almost every time Parker opens his mouth, it's to say something obvious, pointlessly aggressive, or both. As the plot moves on, none of the other characters respect Parker either. The plot is conveyed mostly by impatient order barking, and Red Faction itself, as a miner's revolution, seems to succeed based solely on Parker being conveniently nearby things they need done. I mean, plot happens. There's a whole thing with a scientist named Kapek and his bizarre experiments on the miners, and a whole thing with a ruthless mercenary lady. Parker reacts to these developments with angry confusion. He can't see what the player sees. That once Red Faction figured out its setup and the scope of its ambitions, it had no real interest in tying any of these threads cohesively together at the end. Also, the very climax of the game has a timed memory puzzle to defuse a very large bomb. I actually beat Red Faction for the very first time this playthrough because middle school me never got the randomized puzzle right. So, you beat it, and then the Earth Defense Force arrives, and everything is hunky-dory, and you look back on the game. So much potential. Such fun, mostly. All they needed to do to make a blockbuster Red Faction sequel is to recenter the game around its strong points and move away from its weak ones. It is too bad that the second game did the opposite. Obviously, what people loved about Red Faction was linear corridor shooting and terrible dialogue, right? Oh, and Geomod. You know, it's hard to actually even know where to begin with Red Faction 2. The game is, from start to finish, a total failure to understand what worked about the first game. And then, a whole lot of extra mediocrity thrown in for good measure. Mostly, people ignore the second game completely when talking about the franchise. For one, it's not even on Mars. It's about, I shit you not, a ragtag band of mercenaries taking down a corrupt dictator on Earth. Red Faction 2 tries to go for this whole dirty half-dozen Team of Elites thing that is so hackneyed and so cliché that it's really hard to pull off even if you are trying hard, and this game doesn't even try a little. On the base of a statue to Sopot, the game's first villain, a plaque reads, Chancellor Sopot, gotta love the guy, or you will die. Is it parody? Or is it some kind of not giving a shit? I honestly cannot for the life of me figure out if this entire game is some kind of joke. On the surface, the game does seem to take itself seriously. It goes through its unbelievably predictable motions with a cartoonish sincerity. But all throughout is this acknowledgement of how overwhelmingly mediocre the game is, even a winking pride in it. There are two explanations for Red Faction 2. Either one, it is a failure to give a shit about what makes a good Red Faction game or a good game, period, or else it is two, a flat-out refusal to give a shit about those things. The result is the same, Red Faction 2 is terrible, but the intent behind its awfulness is a riddle of the Sphinx as far as I'm concerned. 
Bizarrely, the game features two big-name action movie stars doing voices, Lance Henriksen and Jason Statham, both slumming at hardcore in what has to be two of their all-time worst voice acting performances. If you ever happen to see either of these two guys at a convention of some sort, I'd encourage you to ask them about Red Faction 2. They probably like hearing questions they've never heard before. In any case, the question you want to ask about Red Faction 2, the question you uh, might find a real answer to when playing the game, is how it differs from the original and why. Since the game is mercifully short, the answers are pretty clear. First and primarily, the second game knows that the first had solid, heavy, fast-paced action. It was linear, but broke up the linearity with incredible variety in numerous vehicle segments. On these points, the sequel actually holds up okay. Variety, if nothing else, is something Red Faction 2 does kind of well in a certain respect. You can bet that you'll be doing something different for different reasons every 20 minutes or so, and that's good. Vehicle sequences are much more robust than in the first game as well, although they're very much on rails. You're the gunner, not the driver, mostly. But you still get to pilot a battle mech, engage in tank battles, and assault office buildings and freeways from the air. It's kind of fun in an extremely generic, if you like shooters, maybe you'll like this kind of way. It just leaves no real impression one way or the other. Without Mars, the setting has no bite. Really, beyond the fact that the first game's Ultor Corporation was propping up Sopot and created the nanotechnology that makes your squad so, oh my god, ultimate badass, there's literally nothing connecting this plot to the other. The revolutionary theme is still there, but you're not with the Red Faction until a very obvious betrayal at the mid-game. The revolution against Sopot is also called the Red Faction because, well... Branding? Name recognition? The plot of Red Faction 2 could have been scribbled on bar napkins and then included as written. I wouldn't really be surprised if it was. Not that the game cares. Instead, it knows that what players really like is a wide arsenal and bullet sponge enemies to soak up the bullets. You really do have a ridiculous number of guns, many with multiple functions, although none feel as iconic as the railgun from the first game. Not even the railgun here in the second. The heat scope is replaced with a little ping icon when enemies are through a wall. That's easier to program, I imagine, but it is comparatively lame. Such is Red Faction 2. Even the variety of levels makes no difference, because the levels are derivative of every first-person shooter cliché in the book. You want four loading screens of sewers? We've got four loading screens of sewers. You want an assault on a beige military base of offices and parking lots? We have got every shade of beige in the goddamn paint sample pack. Weirdly, Perversely, there are a handful of vistas and moments, like the cityscape surrounding this bridge, that actually are kinda cool and seem somewhat unique. Glimmers of actual creativity amid the bullshit. The train station level, moving from older, shuttered stations into the shiny contemporary ones, was one that I actually enjoyed playing. To get to these tiny moments of solid design, you have to fight enemies that are arbitrarily tough and deal with a save system that makes you restart from the last loading screen no matter how far you are into a level. So not only does it suck, it sucks in a way that forces you to replay large sections of it. And in keeping with its commitment to cheeseball video game design, it has some of the most hilariously bad ambient dialogue I've ever heard. Within two minutes of firing up the very first level, an enemy shouted at me, I'm planning a funeral! It's gonna be yours! You know, on some weird deep level, I think I might have missed dialogue like that. High-budget games have a lot riding on at least being somewhat respectable as a piece of entertainment media, of having a little meaning and a little class. Here, no shit's given, no shit's taken, it is a zero-sum shit parade. It's important to see how the first game, while dropping the ball on a lot of its design elements, still had a charismatic core and a tangible sense of ambition, of wanting to be a good game, but not quite managing it all the time. Here, no ambition on the part of the developers leads to no motivation on the part of the player. The push for variety without a backbone of some kind of plot leads to disconnection and confusion in the level design. And, and a huge arsenal means nothing without personality. To use all of your guns because the enemies are bullet sponges and you run out of ammo all the time is quite different from using all of your guns to adapt to tactical need. You gotta wonder, who is this game even for? With its middle school boy power fantasy plot and lazy slash sloppy design, who is this game's target demographic? Geomod is reduced to a literal gimmick. It comes up a dozen times, maybe, and is used as a verb in the objectives window, like Geomod past the door. It throws out almost everything that made Red Faction memorable in exchange for a collection of meaningless back of the box selling points held together with Elmer's glue and snot. The only thing it does right, the only thing really unique about it, is that it incorporates a kind of morality. 
You're given the option to be merciful or wrathful to a number of background characters, like a TV announcer or fleeing office workers. The ending of the game will change, slightly, depending on how you played it, but the endings are just as half-assed as the rest of the game. In the end, that feature is no more meaningful than any other good idea that this game incorporates badly. It's a bad game, man. Literally anyone can see that. Or, I would think so. Reviews at the time actually praised it. IGN gave it a 9.2, saying it was a well-polished shooter that improves on the original in every way. That this game got a 9.2 when it came out in 2002 demonstrates, I think, that even flawed games today are a hell of a lot better than some supposedly good games used to be, and our expectations as gamers are more discerning. Mostly. It would take seven years for another Red Faction game to appear. Which is really not that surprising, considering how little Red Faction 2 leaves the franchise to go forward with. The surprise, really, is that there even would be a third game. A bigger surprise still is that it would be one of the best games of 2009. Red Faction Guerrilla is a total reimagining of the whole setting, one that understands, on a very deep level, how to leverage the setting and game technology for greatest impact. In contrast to the second game, Guerrilla is extremely clever in every department except the plot, and even that works in the game's favor. Guerrilla singularly focuses on one goal. Use the framework of armed revolution to tear down the machinery of the occupying army. Literally. It's a simple idea, but the execution is vibrant, exciting, and best of all, fun as hell. Guerrilla adjusts the scope of the revolution from the first game, pretty much ignoring the second game entirely. It goes from linear first-person shooter to open-world third-person insurgency simulator, a la Grand Theft Auto, Mafia, etc., but with a distinctive art style and an extremely unique presentation. The original Geomod is out the window in favor of something much better. Instead of programming the terrain to be destructible, Gorilla features some of the most realistic and, and dynamic architecture physics ever put in a game. When you fire a missile at a building, that building shatters in a unique pattern to the blast. If you destroy a building's supports, that building falls down. If you drive a dump truck into a building, you can ram halfway through, cover your truck with explosives, and destroy everything in a giant blast, and then harvest scrap to use as upgrade points. It took until this game for the franchise to realize the ambition of Geomod, which is to put the player in meaningful control of the destructive tools available to them. This shift from blowing up terrain to blowing up infrastructure is huge. It makes big explosions a way to actually, literally advance the plot. Not cutscene explosions, but a path of exquisite carnage hand cut by the player across a wide open Mars. In the context of Armored Revolution, every gunfight, every raised command center, every wind turbine you run over in a truck is a small step on the path to liberation. Every trivial act of, of destruction that gamers love to do when they're messing around in open world games like this is given actual meaning and legitimization by the plot. That is brilliant design. What's really striking, though, is how enjoyable it is to be a terrorist in this game. I'm not even remotely the first person to point this out about Red Faction Guerrilla, but it is important to talk about. You are an insurgent fighter using improvised explosives and colossal chutzpah to take down an occupying government. That seems like it would be really heavy and kind of a big deal, but the magic of Guerrilla is that the game is able to let you take this role without even really thinking about it, certainly without minding it. The game says, you like explosions, right? That's what you're here for? And the player says, oh yes, most explosions possible, please. So the game replies, all these guys, I mean literally all of these guys, are bad guys. And it would be great for everybody if you just took them out with explosions. Most explosions possible, right? Could anyone resist that setup? People have complained about how the plot is a fried cheese curd of cliché and bad voice acting, but that is every Red Faction game, and the cheese of the plot is why the player's actions are so damn enjoyable, despite being, from a certain standpoint, morally questionable. The game's plot comes off like a cartoon, and no one is ever really hurt in a cartoon, not actually. The lack of realism gives the player an implicit invitation to put explosives on every last man, woman, and building on Mars and not care at any point for them as people. They're cardboard cutouts, and cardboard cutouts blow up real nice, and you can have a lot of fun with it without it really ever being a moral thing. Plus, despite the revolutionary tones, there's a certain amount of masculine Americana running throughout. The classic southwestern image of desperate men crawling a bleak landscape in weather-beaten old pickup trucks is the guiding aesthetic for the first half of the game. The idea that fascism should be stomped out where you see it by hard-working men and women has an air of greatest generation national spirit. This subtle inclusion of populist, working-class iconography and ideas alongside the more blatantly revolutionary elements further shift the perception away from your characters being anything but the good guy in all circumstances. It would have been so easy for this game to be too serious, or to not care enough. 
but Gorilla seems to genuinely acknowledge that it needs a bit of a soft touch with its theme material for you to have fun with it, and uses the playfulness of the video game format and a by-the-numbers plot to take all the edge off a potentially thorny issue. Armed Revolution also provides a framework for pretty much all of the game's missions besides Demolitions Master. Most of the game is spent doing side missions, and causing chaos to raise popular support for the Red Faction in a region and then erode the EDF's control of that region. You'll have plot missions, but the meat of the game is just that, bouncing across the landscape, righting wrongs, and setting fuses. Whether you're rescuing hostages, or holding off counter-raids, or causing billions of dollars of damage manning a turret on the back of a madman's motorbike, it's all a beautiful blur of destruction, from start to finish. The Demolitions Master side missions aren't really even missions, they're these amazing little puzzles where you have to blow up something in a very specific way with extremely limited resources. They're hard towards the end, but always fun and always challenging, and just so damn satisfying. The way the game renders each act of destruction so uniquely is intoxicating. I didn't want a plot, not a fancy one, I just wanted a bigger rocket launcher. And the game delivers on all those counts. It knows that too much dialogue would sink the game. It lets the setting, the gameplay, and the game's systems of interaction speak for themselves. It's a very confidently designed game that way. It's not high budget. The environments and textures are comparatively on detail versus other open world games at the time, but what they lack in detail they make up for in character. The visual design of everyday objects in the world is consistently charismatic and unique, from building architecture to the design of Mars's fancier sedans and SUVs. It feels like the Mars of Red Faction has a plausible, living culture which you get to participate in, even if you participate violently. And the landscapes are functional and varied, even sometimes achieving some genuinely scenic moments. But the focus isn't on the landscape, it's on the action. The action is as reliable and satisfying as it always has been in the franchise, luckily. The shift from first to third person didn't make the action any less heavy feeling. It might even be a little heavier. There's a wide variety of weapons, and they all feel great. The EDF also comes at you endlessly once you've stirred them up. You absolutely, positively must use hit-and-run tactics. But the chase is great, from the heavy, clunky vehicles chasing each other through the dust or sniping your way through the hills as APCs pursue you. Red Faction Guerrilla is a lot of people's pet favorite title for the Xbox 360 generation of games for these reasons, and it's the cohesiveness of vision that that's, the, that's at the root of it. Heavy action, constant plot-motivated, player-driven destruction, a unique backdrop to frame it all against, that's Red Faction Guerrilla. Gorilla has one piece of single-player DLC, Demons of the Badlands, a prologue to the main game where you play Samania, the marauder inventor who Alec Mason, your main character, ends up with at the end of Gorilla. The marauders are a fun concept, and they're what ties the first game to the third. The captured miners that KPEC had been experimenting on fled into the hills at the end of Red Faction 1, and have been living for generations scavenging from the ruins of the Ultor labs. They're a tribal take on the first game's industrial aesthetic. It's awfully cool, the Marauders inject a little Beyond Thunderdome into the mix, and it integrates well with the otherwise kind of bland conflict between the unilaterally evil EDF and the Red Faction. In Demons of the Badlands, it's all Marauders all the time, kicking the EDF's ass all up and down the street. There's nothing new and nothing innovative about it. It's just one big new region with an absolute ton of things waiting for Samania to make them explode. Just the change in flavor to the Marauders' future tribal aesthetic is enough to make Demons of the Badlands a welcome addition to the game. You also get fun, powerful new weapons. Overpowered, really, but given the shortness of the DLC, some ridiculousness in this department isn't really uncalled for. You also get new Marauder vehicles, including honest-to-god monster trucks. Demons of the Badlands demonstrates more than anything else that what Gorilla created was a winning formula of gameplay and player motivation, bolstered by the kind of ambition and confidence that made the first game so wonderfully memorable. All they needed to do to make a blockbuster sequel was to keep the balance of elements that made Gorilla a truly unique third-person game. How they fucked that up for a second time, a decade after Red Faction 2, is quite a mystery. Red Faction Armageddon is not as bad a game as Red Faction 2, but it is an aggressively mediocre title, and its failures are the same failures of Red Faction 2, just with a lot more budget and polish massaged into the exterior. On the interior, Red Faction Armageddon has absolutely no idea what made Red Faction Guerrilla so fun, and I don't remotely understand how that could have come to pass, considering how thoroughly well-designed the third game is. Armageddon tosses it all out. Inverts it, really. Third-person open-world revolution, driven primarily by player whim, is replaced by completely linear third-person corridor shooting against colorful, fuzzy aliens. I'm serious. That makes no sense, you say. Well, no, it doesn't. It makes none. It sure is what they did, though. 
Like how the second game reduced Geomod to a watered-down gimmick even compared to the first game's spotty implementation, Armageddon takes the architectural physics that made destruction in the third game so amazing and reduces them to a background decoration and an attack option, a way to smash aliens with things in addition to shooting them with things. The open world is gone. How do you even remove that from a game once it's there? They do it by plot contrivance. The game's dastardly villain blows up the terraformer supplying the atmosphere, and terrible storms drive the whole population underground into cave networks. So, you can still destroy buildings, just like you did in Gorilla. They're just, you know, sitting in tiny clusters in a bunch of boring, sterile caves. Almost the whole game is in caves. The reduction in scope is comparable to how Dragon Age 2 cut back the size of the world exponentially from the first, but while Dragon Age 2 had a lot of worthwhile plot elements, Armageddon takes up the franchise torch of having a cliché mess for a plot. Like Red Faction 2, this sequel has everything no one asked for from previous titles, and precious little of what everyone did want. One key lesson they could have learned from Red Faction 2 is that if a player doesn't have any motivation, it's going to be hard for them to have any fun. A key lesson they could have learned from Gorilla is that if your story is lackluster, you should try to hide it behind the gameplay, in the background, where it's less noticeable. I'm Armageddon ignores both lessons and features probably more cutscenes and voice acting work than any previous Red Faction game. Indeed, it seems to have the highest budget and most technical polish out of all four. But all that money, all that action, all those words are a total waste. Armageddon's blockbuster plot is an outrageously mediocre slog through line after line after line of square-jawed, tough-guy bullshit. Alec Mason, from Gorilla was a really generic, quite tough guy with a crew cut, but he was a likable one, with a sense of humor and a little touch of humanity to him. Darius Mason, Alec's grandson and your main character in Armageddon, is an even tougher tough guy with an even shorter crew cut. Darius is the absolute definition of the generic, default, no-effort player character. He's every bit as bad as Alias, your player character from Red Faction 2, but instead of the second game's staunch commitment to not giving a shit, Armageddon goes to great lengths to try to make Darius seem like a complicated guy going through hard times. So... Darius is a bit of the war hero in the Red Faction, the Red Faction having come from their victory in Gorilla and just stuck around as a generic good guy military force. It's what they are in this game. No revolution, just a swell bunch of fellas teaming up against threats to Mars. So Darius the war hero gets outsmarted by Hale, the villain, who destroys the terraformer and drives everybody underground. Years later, Darius is a scrapper for hire who gets called to excavate a mysterious ruin for a shadowy group. If you immediately thought, that's probably the villain tricking Darius into unleashing disaster into the tunnels of Mars so that everybody blames Darius, well, that's how it is. The game thinks that this is really deep character building. Darius is a big tough war hero, but he gets tricked and he's misunderstood, so he has to prove to everyone that he really is very heroic and extremely manly by single-handedly killing off this whole race of surprise aliens. See? He's walking the hero's journey! And this brings us to another key failing of Red Faction 2 that Armageddon suffers from as well. A lack of ambition on the part of the developer leads to a lack of respect on the part of the player. There are, as in the second game, flashes of creativity, but this game is overwhelmingly smug about its generic bullshit, and it wears on you pretty quick. It is simultaneously too serious and too boring, which is a really bad combination. If there's one thing you can rely on in a Red Faction game, however, it's a baseline of solid and enjoyable gunplay. Armageddon has, I almost hate to say it, but probably the best shooting mechanics out of all four games. It's got everything good about the shooting in Gorilla, but faster and more fluid. And you do get one amazing toy to play with, the magnet gun. You can use the magnet gun to pull anything you attach an anchor to violently towards another anchor. Anything. Pull an enemy towards another enemy and make them collide, make a building fall down in a whole cluster of fuzzy little evil aliens. However you want to play around with it, play around with it. It has unlimited use. It's a genuinely novel and fun bit of design, and by far the most iconic and memorable thing about Armageddon. The game also pits you against, numerically, way more enemies than any other Red Faction title. A single playthrough has kill counts in the thousands. So you have ample opportunity to use the wide arsenal, an arsenal that in many ways takes off to Red Faction 2 more than any other Red Faction title, from its focus on dual-wielding pistols and dual-wielding submachine guns to its wide range of exotic, neat-idea guns. In another design cue from the first two games, Armageddon features lengthy vehicle sequences. You get two kinds of battle mech, an air fighter of some sorts, and many other vehicle and turret events. These are actually a lot of fun. You kill a staggering number of things, the special effects are bright and sharp, and it breaks up the rhythm of the game's on-foot combat. That on-foot rhythm consists of clearing waves of enemies, color-coordinated by attack style and toughness, destroying the nodes they spawn from, trashing some incidental two-story buildings, and then collecting the barrels of upgrade points the developers have hid behind doors and around dead ends, and then moving on to the next part of the cave where you'll do the exact same thing. 
This is repeated over and over across a dozen hours. That's a rhythm that needs breaking up. Honestly, the only interesting levels are the ones that reference previous Red Faction games. From shooting your way through the ruins of dust and Major Town from the third game to scavenging lost nanotech from Ultor Laboratories, it's these settings that they've previously covered that are the most compelling. Weirdly enough, this fourth game continues to expand on the lore of the first, making it so that the plague from the first game was something that the evil mad scientist Capek reverse engineered from these weird alien creatures, and that Ultor knew about the aliens the whole time. It's a strange integration, and I'm hesitant to say that it even works at all. The Mad Scientist plot was the cheesiest part of Red Faction the first, and to spin a whole game off of that tangent seems really misguided. But so it is for Armageddon. It has a new feature that sounds fun, a wrist device that automatically rebuilds structures you destroyed or had been destroyed previously. Functionally, the player absolutely needs this gimmick because this is a linear corridor shooter where you have to blow up the corridors, so often you end up having to repair the way forward after you fight through it. It's a solution to an inconvenience posed by the removal of the open world, which sounds a lot less cool than nano repair function. By the end of the game, you've repaired the terraformer and defeated the alien with their one weakness. Spoilers, it's air! Couldn't have guessed it. So, the game undoes the handicap that it gave the setting by driving the population underground at the end of it, but Armageddon was a disappointment to both fans and the publisher, so THQ discontinued the entire series. One final piece of DLC was released for it, a desperate bid to capture the player's attention for just a couple more hours, for just eight more dollars. Path to War is a flailing mess. It's a strange final plea to the player to forget about Red Faction Guerrilla and think about what makes Armageddon so... Well, ultimately forgettable, but the word that the developers were looking for was probably great. Path to War is four new missions, all from slightly different perspectives. The first mission lets you play as Malice. Ha ha ha, right? Hell's second in command for his zealous marauder doom army as they assault the terraformer. The whole mission is one long aerial assault. Honestly, I'm not sure why they felt like the terraformer was so compelling an idea. We already spent at least two hours there in the main campaign at the beginning and at the end. Why more? Yes, we're all aware that the Terraformer is a big deal, but choosing it as the, DLC's, as the DLC's focal point means that the player won't even get the opportunity to see something new. So, you get the Terraformer from Hale's side in the fighter craft, and then you get to be a tank-driving man for the Red Faction side for a little while. It's fun, sure, but pointless and derivative of all sorts of Red Faction you've already played, whether the bland tank missions in Red Faction 2 or the bland Terraformer run at the beginning of Armageddon. The third mission puts you back in Darius's shoes, right before the opening of the game. I mean, what did Darius do before the main campaign is a fine question, but I wish they'd had a more ambitious scope than, oh, like, right before? Oh, he's fighting very nearby. It's more of the well-programmed, pointless third-person action mayhem than Armageddon is characterized by. There's no resolution to any of these missions because the campaign begins right after. Then, in the final mission, it's suddenly five days after the aliens were released and you're on your way to Bastion, about a third of the way through the main campaign. This short fourth mission is all about killing Malice, since he didn't actually come up in the main campaign and now he's a loose thread. It's as if all four of these missions were not actually made as DLC, it feels more like they were cut from the main campaign and then thrown in like the deleted scenes reel on the DVD extras menu. It is a huge ripoff for $8. And it might have been the last Red Faction thing ever, this passionless exercise in paint-by-numbers action game design. Luckily, it won't be. The franchise was recently bought by Nordic Games after THQ's bankruptcy, and Nordic Games' first move with the franchise was to update the Red Faction Guerrilla PC version with DirectX 11 support and remove the janky broken games for Windows Live components. It's a great move. Not only does it show that they care about past games, it shows that they care about the right past game. It's hard to say where the franchise will actually go from here, but from a decade and a half of Red Faction games, the one thing you can definitively say is that it is hard to keep a good setup down. Thanks for watching. I'd like to give special thanks to the patrons on Patreon who have helped make this video possible. I received an unbelievable outpouring of support through this crowdfunding service, and I want to thank some of the top donors, including Cassie Bayer, Preston Allen, so, uh, Sheik, Espen Steinsness, Sigmund Copper, Stephen Lark, Junus, Hen Young, Hakan Seiliago, William Kroish, Jonas Neves, Signet Jensen, Richard Stevenson, Stephen Parson, Kimo Heikena, Joe Wolf, Oliver, White Zero, 
Yuri Peknes, Sil, Dalton Seiler, Jonathan Fleikener, and the many others who have decided to donate to my account. You're the folks who are helped keeping me out of food service, and I muchly appreciate it. Thanks again for watching.